Football is not about life or death. It is more important than that. In 1998, Brazilian soccer player Roberto Carlos scored a free kick against France for what was known as the impossible kick. Like most cases, the laws of physics explain how this impossible kick is very much possible. As the ball is in the air, the ball spins about an axis perpendicular to the flow of the air across it. The air travels faster where the outer limits of the ball is, moving in the same direction of the airflow compared to the center of the ball. This reduces the pressure at the top of the airflow. The opposite effect occurs on the other side of the ball where the air travels slower compared to the center of the ball, making the pressure increase. This imbalance in the forces makes the ball deflect, which is known as the Magnus effect. The two general forces acting on a soccer ball spinning through the air are the lift force and the drag force. The lift force is the upward force or sideward force causing the Magnus effect. The drag force acts in the opposite direction to the path of the ball. The coefficient of drag depends on the velocity of the ball. The coefficient drops suddenly when the airflow at the surface of the ball changes from being smooth to turbulent. A slow moving ball experiences a much higher retarding force. However, if the ball travels fast enough so the airflow over the ball is turbulent, the ball experiences a smaller retarding force. Therefore, a faster moving ball makes it difficult to save since it's not only moving at high speeds, but it also doesn't slow down as might be expected. Studies done with golf balls show that a slow moving ball with a lot of spin will have a larger sideways force than a faster moving ball with that same amount of spin. This means that as the ball slows down at the end of its trajectory, the curves become bigger. This is because the spin on a ball produces a higher lift coefficient, therefore a bigger Magnus force. However, increasing the velocity to a given spin will reduce the lift coefficient. His high speed, about 130 kilometers an hour, and great distance, about 30 meters, allow the ball to curve right at the end of his free kick. With all of this said, the amount of force he exerted into his kick allowed the ball to travel so far before it started to curve. If he had put less force into his kick, the curve would have become predictable and easier for the goalie to save. Many factors come into play when it comes to soccer and its physics, such as the distance from the net, the placement of the ball relative to the center of the width of the field, air resistance, drag, and the placement of other players on the field. Many players take into account all of these factors as they kick the ball, but often they don't know the physics behind it. They just know there's a certain way to kick it to score. If a player kicks the ball in line with the ball's center of gravity, then the ball continues in a straight line. If a player kicks the ball just off its center and the angle between the leg and foot remains at 90 degrees, the ball will be given a spin. If the ball is kicked closer to its center, then the foot touch the ball for a shorter time and over a smaller area, they cause both the spin and the velocity of the ball to decrease. This means there's an optimum place to hit the ball if you want a maximum spin. If you hit the ball too close or too far from its gravity, it will not obtain any spin. There are different ways to kick the ball in order to predict where the ball will land. Assuming the player is right-footed with the inside of the foot, the ball will curve outward in the same direction as you kicked your foot with, and in this case, it would curve outward to the right. How much force was put into the kick will determine the width of the curve. The softer, the wider. After it curves outward, it will slowly curve inward heading towards its target. Now, with the outside of the foot, the player can slightly swing across its body with enough force to lift the ball. If right-footed, the ball will continue straight to the left, then curve back to the right closer to its target near the end. It's the opposite if left-footed. This is how Roberto Carlos kicked the ball. Kicking the ball like Carlos did requires a lot of force. I didn't kick the ball like he did since I don't have enough power to lift and curve the ball with the outside of my foot. However, I can do so with the inner part of my foot. Being right-footed, I hit the ball slightly to the left from its center with the inside of my foot, curving the ball to the right. The ball then returned to the middle of my net, which was my original target. For me to improve my kick like a professional, I must be able to exert much more force from my foot to the ball in order to lift the ball. I would also have to be very accurate in how wide I initially kicked the ball. I would have to also have my free kick traveling at a much higher speed. This way the curve is much less predictable. To get more power, I can have a longer run before kicking the ball, allowing myself to put more force into the kick. 
Also, leaning toward the ball instead of away allows me to keep balance and put more power into the kick. Also, as shown in Roberto's clip, he follows through with his kick, following its motion. This follow through pushes all of his power towards the ball, making it as powerful as it can be. In all of his motions, he puts as much of his weight into the kick to increase the overall force in the kick. As said from author Deji Badiru from the book The Physics of Soccer, Biology determines what we are. Chemistry explains what makes us what we are. And physics describes what we do. Physics is what explains how Ricardo scored that impossible kick and how an average soccer player like me can do something as spectacular as Roberto Carlos.